Hello, everybody. We're bringing you Block Digest number 79 on Sunday, February 11th, block height 508,701. Uh, sadly, uh, Mr. Rick couldn't join us today. He's feeling a little under the weather, but uh, he still cranked out some awesome show graphics for us. I hope he's feeling a little better soon. But we do have JW with us. Hey, guys. Miss Janine. Hey. And Mr. Acknix and his Bitcoin bus. Hey, what's up? Alrighty then. So this next thing, uh, this first story, is pretty much exactly what you don't do if you want to be a responsible uh, business owner in this space. So I guess uh, you want to take it away, Janine? Yeah, we don't um, often, there's not too much Ethereum stuff to cover in general, but when there is, it generally has to do with some kind of uh, mishap in terms of security because it seems like that's often a uh, second class citizen, which unfortunately in this case, um, I did appreciate the fact that the My Ether Wallet account was one of the few uh, Ethereum related accounts that would often tweet about um, security related issues. But unfortunately, I don't know how fully those people, especially Taylor in this case, grasped that responsibility because uh, basically we woke up, I think it was yesterday or the day before, uh, February 9th. Yeah, we woke up, uh, most people woke up and they were super confused because uh, the My Ether Wallet Twitter account uh, had suddenly lost all of its followers and anyone who had been following that account was now following an account called My Crypto, uh, which was very strange because um, apparently Twitter lets you do that if you change the handle. You know, it's kind of it's kind of a way that if you want if people want to change their handle, it automatically makes sure you're following the new account. And I guess the old account with the old handle still is live somehow. Um, but in this case, that mechanism on Twitter was used uh, basically to take the account of my Ether wallet and change it into my crypto because there's apparently been an ongoing dispute for the past at least a half year or so between the co-founders of the my Ether wallet project or company. Not really sure what it is, and that seems to be part of the problem. Um, and so no warning whatsoever was given when the account was changed. Uh, it just happened one morning and people were freaking out because as uh, if you if you look through the history of Taylor's tweets, she has a very uh, broad understanding of the fact that there is a big phishing and scam threat in this space, especially with Ethereum because that's where most of the ICOs are. Um, if you look through her Reddit comments, you know, you can see her responding to people getting fished. And so obviously that scared people to find that they were following an account that was saying, you know, we're a new service wallet. Um, the previous wallet is still functioning. It was just a very weird circumstance. So uh, within several hours, the new My Crypto account tweeted that, uh, yes, we have split with My Ether wallet. Uh, they wouldn't. They still have not given any details as to what the dispute was. There has been a legal document that came out um, that I'm not sure who is who published it, but it probably was published by um, Kosala. I think that's how you pronounce his name. Um, who is the one of the co-founders? And it basically uh, explains that he requested access to financial documents related to the My Ether Wallet, aka Mu. Um, business. And for some reason, even though he is legally entitled to those documents, regardless of whether he, uh, whether she believes he still has them or not, he's entitled to receive them upon request as a, you know, one of the, I suppose, shareholders of the company. And she refused that. And so they apparently came to some kind of agreement that they were going to split the companies. But um, at least based on the response from Kusala to the Twitter account being changed and taking all the followers, he did not expect that to be part of the agreement as far as I understand it. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's been a lot of outrage on Twitter over this. And to be honest, I don't, I don't even really care as much about the specifics of their personal dispute or whether it was justified in them splitting up or anything. Uh, what I care about is the fact that 
she she seems to be someone who is well aware of the risks of this kind of thing happening. In fact, in one of the comments that she gave on Reddit one time, she was asked why my Ether wallet had wallet in the name because technically, uh, my Ether wallet is actually not a wallet in the traditional sense that we would think of as a wallet. Um, and I'm not sure which link it. Yes, that was one of them. So um, that was about someone asking why they don't have uh, a certificate for their domain. And she was saying that they didn't have enough money because they weren't really a big company. They were just an open source project at the time. Um, in this, yeah, this one, yeah, that one is about rename. So, so someone asked, you know, why, why are you called wallet? And she was saying, well, we could change it, but that would quote, probably lead to more confusion, but it's certainly a possibility. So she is well aware of the risks of creating confusion with sudden unannounced name changes. Um, so the fact that she took it upon herself to do this without any warning seems to be kind of that, at least in my view, is irresponsible, um, especially because she tweeted from the new My Crypto account saying that she had been treating her uh, the My Ether wallet account as a personal account, which is something you should never do pretty much at any scale of any business or project. And if you start to do that and your business starts to get bigger, you should definitely stop because it's never a good idea to treat business accounts um, for personal things, not only because you may end up having to transfer that account and sharing information with a new party that may have not been entitled to this personal conversation you've been having with people on the social media site, but because it you psychologically you end up tying your identity to this brand. And so if you have to give it up, then it's like you're giving away part of yourself, which you shouldn't have been putting yourself into it that deeply in the first place. You should always have a separation between personal and business accounts. That's why a lot of people do that on Twitter. Um, or at least they have a little marker saying who's tweeting. And so you know that, you know, there's another personal account that you can talk to if you want to have a private conversation. Um, but yeah, the response has been pretty poor in my opinion. I mean, the first post that they made, it was super long. It was basically Taylor laying out the history of the project and kind of implying very subtly by posting like GitHub uh, commit charts, like the calendar, that uh, she had been doing most of the work, which I don't think is the very last graph. I'm not sure, is it this one? Um, it should be towards the bottom. I don't know if this is the one that has the GitHub calendar, but one of them does. Uh, it might be the other one. Uh, if you go to the top, go to the, yeah, go to the top of this one. There's a, should be a link to her statement somewhere. Yes, bear with us, um, audience. This is. Yeah, it's okay. Anyway, so, <laughs> yeah, so basically as uh, if Shinobi, if you want to look for it or not. Um, anyway, the, one of the last, the one of the last calendar pictures she put in her post, basically showed that uh, Kosala, if I hope that's how you pronounce his name, he stopped contributing as much as he was regularly, um, sometime around G July first, uh, which is about a month or two before the legal dispute started. I think in September, which is when he filed a he requested that she give him the financial documents. So clearly there has been some dispute going on for at least a half year, probably more. And I think it's completely understandable if, if there's an, this, you know, lack of clarity over the legal dispute that, you know, we would see that pattern where someone's not contributing as much to a project that maybe they anticipated they would be kicked out of or losing some way. Um, so that doesn't surprise me. It could also be possible that, you know, he you know, decided to slack off out of nowhere. And that's why the separation started. We don't really know because there hasn't really been a lot of clarity on this issue. But um, yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it should be towards the bottom. I think it's the last calendar. Uh, yeah, there. there, that one, yeah. So as you can see, she like marked out where, like what kinds of changes they were doing at each of the points. It's not very clear because she's kind of just pointing at rows, but roughly that time of the year when they were working on things. And you can see there's a very clear cutoff point in July for Kasala, 
Um, and she, even though she didn't say this, she was not disparaging against him at all in the post, which is why it was so confusing. Because, you know, if I was in a situation where I felt I had to basically change the handle of a Twitter account, create a new one, take all of the followers with it without the permission of my co-founder, I would only feel compelled to do that in the instance where I felt my co-founder was such an unstable person that I would never be able to resolve the conflict or if they were actually a danger to the users of the wallet. Um, but the fact that she mentions multiple times in this post saying, you know, she doesn't disparage him at all, says nothing negative about him outside of kind of subtly implying that he wasn't doing a lot of work in the last half year. Um, she doesn't say anything negative about him. She even says people should continue using my ether wallet, uh, which sounds very gracious, but then again, why why is this why is there this disparity between how she actually treated him in terms of basically taking all the followers of the the Twitter account uh, without notice or at least without apparent notice and causing a big stir um, and then also saying people should continue using his wallet even though apparently the service they were giving at least as a pair was so bad that they had to end up splitting on a very uh, very uh, not so positive uh, light. So this just all seems kind of messed up to me. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, this kind of like, I, it might seem like I'm jumping a little bit on a tangent here, but I really think this does kind of factor into a lot of the stuff we've been talking about with exchanges in this ecosystem and just kind of the general like atmosphere of amateur hour and especially when it comes to something like interacting with a blockchain to manage your assets like something like this a wallet service isn't really immune to that either and i mean like this is this is really amateur hour like if i was an ethereum user and i used this platform to manage my crypto i sure as hell wouldn't do it from this point on I mean, this this pretty much looks to me just like childish drama going on in the background between two individuals, and then that actually coming up to have a concrete effect on the service itself. And like, regardless of the fact she's trying to be nice in public, like, and not really cast aspersions at him blatantly, but this totally seems like, you know, silly personal issues. Like, why would this have gotten to the point of actually going to court to request documents and records for the company, like if there wasn't some kind of animosity going on, it would just be, here's the records. Okay, let's part and go our own way. And I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and the thing that confuses me because I've talked to several people about this situation and some people have said, you know, the reason she took the Twitter followers is because, you know, she put so much effort into it and all of that. And if I, but my, my response is if I was coming from her point of view and I, you know, I had this, you know, vision and motivation to create a better product, I would want to make as clean a break as possible, which would mean creating a new Twitter account, not just changing the handle and taking all of the followers, even though, you know, I guess she had a personal connection with a lot of people through direct messages. Um, Ironically, you know, her, one of the advice uh, points she gives a lot on Reddit is that you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't be using DMs or opening things in DMs. I don't know what she was using it for, but it apparently it was personal stuff to make as clean a break as possible, which I have some experience with that, as the people on this show uh, well know. Um, I would want to make a clean break so that when I'm going into my new business with all these new investors and this team that was basically hired in the last half year to start, you know, doing uh, more of the work so that she's not, you know, constantly busy with everything as she's written about that she's had to deal with a lot of stress. Uh, I would want to make a clean break, have the new name, maybe, you know, maybe not even use the same code, but you know, if she had a big part in building that it's open source, that's not a problem, but I definitely would not, um, do something knowing that it could continue an ongoing legal dispute and possibly put the new company in jeopardy with all of these uh, legal bills. That je that just does not sound like a smart avenue to me. Like I really hope the 70, 77,000 followers for that account were worth it. I don't think it's worth it because 
um, probably with the amount of investment money she got, she could, uh, I don't know, the, apparently her husband is wonderful at marketing, so it shouldn't take that long for them. And they're also, apparently this is the, my ether wallet was the most popular wallet for Ethereum. Apparently if you ask any Ethereum dev, like 90% of them will recommend this wallet if they're not using their own contrived personal thing that they made themselves. Most of them will recommend this wallet. So it's not like it's, you know, some small side project. This is like a big deal in the Ethereum space. And so she would obviously have enough support to, you know, start from start from scratch in terms of the company and maybe the code sense like that. I don't see how that would be a problem. She's not coming out of the blue. Um, it just seems that she's, you know, not only put the trust with the users at risk, but she's put the new company at risk from a legal standpoint. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like you said, this is how most people I'm aware of use Ethereum uh, aside from, you know, hardware wallets. And I, like, I find it hard to believe that that didn't factor into the whole decision to just pull a switcheroo with the Twitter. Like you, like I feel like this very much ha had a conscious understanding of, of the software's role in the ecosystem and the difference that just trying to pull that switcheroo and maintaining those users would have. And it's like not only is it just childish and disingenuous, but it's it's something that's literally going to foundationally rock an entire cryptocurrency ecosystem. Like it, it's not just like, uh, oh, uh, this wallet did something stupid, but that's okay because there's dozens of other ones. Yeah, and if we want to go through a few of the Reddit posts that I I was just going through it because maybe she had indicated in the past several months that there had been issues with uh, her co-founder. She doesn't allude to anything except one time um, several months ago where she said that uh, Kosala is no longer the core developer of the wallet um, because someone someone was asking who he was and um, ass assumed that she was the core developer and um, she said that he was. Um, and I think that, oh, that was two months ago. So right around December, that was that was when, um, I think that's the latest, the latest email with the legal document was sometime in December, I think December 13th where his lawyers were still requesting financial documents. Um, but other than that, she didn't indicate anything publicly that she was having issues with him. She just said, we're onboarding new people. Um, and that was the other thing. Apparently all of the people or most of them from my ether wallet have migrated to my crypto. So, you know, it's very, it could, it's very possible that, you know, maybe, maybe Kosala is not a trustworthy person to be getting a wallet service from, or at least a, blockchain explorer service. Uh, but then I don't think that um, if that's the case, then I don't think it's responsible of her to then say that people should continue using that service if she was, you know, willing to go to this much, this much risk to split for him. Um, so yeah, her handle is insomnia sex. Interesting name, but uh, <laughs> there's a... <laughs> Uh, the, I mean, she has talked about sleepless nights. I don't know if that's, um, all right. You're digging that's yourself wrong. into a hole very fast. <laughs> uh, so let's look at a few other ones. I know that when I'm looking for some, uh, software that I'm going to trust my life savings to, I, uh, I prefer to see handles like that. It, it just, it's such a sense of trust that it builds credibility. Yeah. Professionalism. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, you know, handles are apparently a problem here. Um, uh, so this was the one I mentioned earlier about um, someone was saying, why don't they get an EV certificate? And she was saying the company's not big enough. They don't have money. Um, oh, yeah, the interesting comment, um, one of the ones she said that uh, around the time, I think it was like a month or two before the legal dispute started, she claimed that she moved the My Ether Wallet donation funds into her treasure yeah, for this one. Yeah, so she said, I recently moved some of our donation funds to my Trezor, not the Trezor, not the company Trezor, my Trezor for safekeeping. And so I'm kind of wondering if that was part of the financial disagreement that he wanted to 
see some financial records related to that. Um, Because if the company's not even big enough to have a bank account, then I don't know what financial documents he would be uh, he would be looking for, but if she had been holding donation funds in her trezor, then uh, that seems like a bit of a situation that would cause contention, um, in my guess. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't even yeah. understand that post. So now I have one address that is mine and one address that is the donations. What what does that even mean? Um, I'm gonna wildly speculate and ask: Did she maybe? misappropriate some money and then kick off the entire disagreement in the background yeah Yeah, i mean there's i would prefer to just uh, because apparently uh kasala well kasala did make a public statement i don't know if he's going to make another one um if we want to pull that up i think it's like the official my ether wallet statement it was on reddit and i think it was called yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, I found it. Incoming thing on the screen. There you go. Yeah, so he was also pretty gracious. He didn't say anything that was disparaging to her. Basically, he gave his own version of the history of the wallet, saying that he actually founded it, and he brought her in to do more of the marketing and UX stuff um, for the wallet. Um, but I... Yeah, I'm not, it still doesn't give exactly any detail as to what what started the dispute and why things ended up this way. Because um, he, he, he did refer on Twitter to the, the handle changing as illegal. So I don't know if he's planning to uh, launch a lawsuit in order to get it back. Because um, the, the one interesting thing about when you, when you do that on Twitter, it um, it removed the verification tag from the My Etherwallet account, which I think is like the most dangerous part of this is that you basically remove the verification from an account that was previously verified. Now people assume, or and I also assume that when um, when you migrate or split accounts like that, that you take the verification with you to your new account. But actually that doesn't happen. Um, apparently they still had to go through a whole verification process in order to do that. And they did that very quick because as soon as I saw the account within like half a day, um, it was already verified. So they planned this pretty well in advance um, in terms of doing that. It wasn't a split second decision. Um, but I think it's, again, irresponsible that it resulted in an account that was previously verified to become unverified and appear untrustworthy. Yeah. I mean, imagine if this was blockchain info and just like half of the company just broke off, like stole the Twitter account and, and then are trying to tell users to use this new service instead. I mean, how would that look? Like, it... <laughs> It, it's just ridiculously unprofessional and it destroys your credibility on pretty much every level possible. But if you're an Ether, uh, Ethereum wallet, do you have any credibility to start with? Can you really go lower than that? Well, I mean, you know, I obviously like everybody should know my views on Ethereum itself by now, but that I don't think that implies that everybody in, in a fringe way involved in the ecosystem is a scammer or is consciously trying to sell some something that they know isn't going to work in the long run. But w- when I see something like this, like it's, I have to kind of rethink that in this specific instance, at least. I mean, like y- you think that uh, if their intentions or at least her intentions were like genuinely pure, she would take this a little more seriously as a maintainer of one of the biggest, like the wallet in the ecosystem that people use. Like I can only think of off the top of my head as an alternative, um, the actual mist browser, which is riddled with problems, a ledger or a Trezor, some other hardware wallet or Jax. Um, and I think maybe Koinami, but like, that's it. And as far as Jax, um, I don't believe they were st- storing and managing keys uh, in an encrypted manner. And I believe Koinami also was operating that same way. So I would personally brush those off as uh, insecure. And then a hardware wallet costs money. Like th- this is really the option for a, a stable Ethereum wallet. 
And like, if I was an Ethereum user, I would be feeling pretty uncertain right now about how to securely manage my funds. Yeah, I'm just saying, I mean, there's there's a lot of people that are in Ethereum that are new and uh, and they don't really know what they've gotten into. But if you've been around for years, it's probably hard for you not to know that whatever values on Ethereum is getting built uh, on Bitcoin through RSK. And that's almost no value because the whole uh, programming language solidity is just an absolute disaster, right? Um, and that um, simplicity uh, is going to work on Bitcoin and it's like it's being done the right way, right? Now, I, I'm not saying everybody that has Ethereum knows all those things, but I think if you built the Ethereum wallet and you've been in the space for years, you know those things and you know that this is basically just a scam that's uh, that's working its way out of the system. So I don't, I, I, mean, I would assume not... that if you've been around for years in Ethereum, you're a scammer. I mean, I'm not so sure, JW, because like this is this is an issue I like see in the crypto space in general. I mean, even Bitcoin in a large number of cases. Like, uh, you know, as a non-programmer, like it, without any kind of real specialization in computer science, it boggles my mind how many people who do have that experience, who actually do professionally program as a career, who just completely do not understand the the larger like architectural picture of a, a blockchain system they they don't get it like they can write code they can plug into the api they can build stuff on top of it but when you really start trying to ask like how does the base protocol work that there's glaring holes in their knowledge and i really don't think that you can assume just because somebody does have a formal background in computer science or programming that they have the the understanding to really assess what is there isn't a scam in this space because like i said i like i have no formal experience in any of that and i constantly run into people in that situation who like it scares me how little they seem to know right i think it's cause and effect well, there, there, there's there i mean it, it, the the field is so dense that, that once you immerse yourself in it, 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 you kind of become like autistic in a way. You, you, you stop being able to, to, to see the bigger picture because you're so far down in the mines. You're in the pits working. And and to get out of that mindset takes time. It takes it takes um, observation outside of that uh, out of outside of being in that pit. Right. So I, I think that's right. But if I, I, I could give you that in some cases, right? Like there, there are some altcoins that are doing interesting things. There's not very many of them, none on the top 10, but there are some altcoins that are interesting and that's hard to figure out, but some like Ethereum, like, I mean, how many times they can't even build a multi-sig wallet. Right. And I, if, if there's a programmer in Ethereum, um, in, in that, you know, we'll call it an ecosystem of Vipers or whatever you want to call that thing. If you're in there for years and you don't know that it's not even possible to build a secure multi-sig transaction, then that's willful. It's because you're just not interested, right? It's not part of what's putting uh, putting bread on the table um, and that's all you're concerned about. It's not because it's so complicated, you just can't get your head around it. So I think it's the interest that causes the ignorance, not the ignorance that makes you, Absol um, you know. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that has to do with the the, the money, right? too right if you're living paycheck to paycheck it may be harder to get that time to gain perspective but if you're sitting there and you're getting paid well you have no excuse so stop being so greedy take the time to, to gain the introspective and and you know get the full picture yeah and yeah, that kind I'm, of what i'm saying is i think they have they if if they have those sort of desires they've already done it right and they've left so you the only people that you have left in ethereum are going to be the self-selected either folks that are like scammers or just totally apathetic whether it's a scam or not yeah and the the part you know the fact the the aspect of you know money being involved in whether because the thing that frustrates me is like to give her some credit she has been doing a lot of the security related announcements for the theorem community through this wallet account and that, like, I, I don't see how that should not be a bit of a red flag for Ethereum as a whole, because this woman was basically, you know, contributing to a wallet service that was free. It was getting donations, but it was free. There was no revenue model. And so she, I mean, I don't know her, so I don't, I can't verify any of her story, but she was, part of her statement was that she, you know, 
it's been hard, like stressful dealing with all of the customer service stuff, plus not making a lot of money from doing this. And it's like, if Ethereum has, there's all this money in Ethereum, why, why is it that a woman who is barely making any money or any person making barely any money is responsible for security announcements for this thing? Like that just, that scares the hell out of me. Like why, the whole reason I like that account was because that was where I basically got all of the tip offs about what was happening security wise in Ethereum. Um, why is she the person that's been handling that for years why like you know actually i i was thinking this earlier but i didn't want to say anything because i wasn't really sure how the revenue for the project works but i mean this just immediately to me seemed like a money grab like an attempt to take control of this project and then find some way to monetize it because i really like i can't think of any other reason why you would do this like it's like do people like who likes just taking on more work with no gain for themselves? Yeah, and I mean, I would kind of give her, you know, the if it's true that, you know, she's been doing all of this, if she's basically been building the wallet for Ethereum, getting no money, like I'm not surprised that if she was motivated to do this out of money at all. Um, but it's like, why, why was none of this, like, if this is the wallet, why was none of, did this dispute like go completely unnoticed by everyone in Ethereum? Because all of the tweets that I was seeing about people who were supporting were saying that they didn't know anything about this dispute, but they were going to support it. It's like, why do you, why it has a two team, uh, project or two person project been handling you know, this much stress for years. It just, that that seems completely unstable to me. And now what is when every, everyone going to do? Like if I, if I was her and I'd been watching people getting rich on scams and ICOs for two years, like, I don't know how, how good I would feel about that. Um, that doesn't excuse what she did in regards to, you know, scaring all of those users and, you know, taking over their Twitter account. But I mean, this, like the idea that this doesn't, reflect something larger going on with Ethereum in general. Um, I don't think this is isolated. Well, yeah, I mean, like really aside from Bitcoin and like the forked coins compatible with it, like the, the software out there to actually interact with a blockchain aside from the main client itself, like it's almost non-existent. And like things like Litecoin really only have a decent support because it's pretty much just copy and paste the code from Bitcoin and change a few things. But it's and like that just that should go to show. I mean, to to kind of get on the maximalist uh, soapbox for a second, like why so many people are Bitcoin maximalists? It's the only thing with a robust ecosystem with all of the different software that it has out there and all of the effort being poured into it. I mean, like, look, Ethereum is the second most valuable cryptocurrency out of all of them. And this is their, their situation. This is how the super majority of people manage their funds. Like th their ability to interact with Ethereum is, is thrown in the air and the trust they, they place in that method is in this situation. Like that's insane. That is literally insane. Yeah, how many people yeah. do you think would have downloaded an update if she just tweeted out an update? And how many of those people would have checked to make sure it was signed or um, wasn't just uh, move all the funds to her wallet, right? Probably 50%, 60% maybe? Yeah, I mean, well, to her credit, she actually did sign uh, the state. She like published her statement, a copy of it on Reddit, and it was signed with her key that's available on Keybase, which... Where I was like, oh, that's actually something that people in this space rarely do. Like when Segway2x was canceled, no PGP keys. It's like these CEOs don't know what PGP key is or, you know, why signing a statement like that would be necessary. So, <laughs> right. But um, what I'm saying is like with Bitcoin, if there was a, if there was a big push, there's a lot of people looking at the code, right? If there was a big code release, there's, there's so many yeah. interested developer eyeballs on this and everything that's happening. Um, and obviously that's not the case over in Ethereum land, right? So it would have been a, it would have probably been a hell of an attack if she just pushed out, even if, you know, she could have signed it with her own key, right? 
but she certainly has an account where I think a lot of people would have immediately downloaded an update if she had said that it was like an urgent security fix or something. So it, it definitely could be worse um, if if a lot of, you know, a lot of the community is putting their trust in a random Twitter handle with a pretty poorly built uh, wallet. Yeah, and it's like this, this ecosystem is very, very far from fully developed and mature and it's something that people really need to be more aware of like the the, the amount of of like reddit posts and just statements all over the place i see from like like to kind of bridge into like the next topic um i i don't have the tweet up right now but like somebody invested in rayblox um which rebranded as nano the uh, everybody gets a blockchain. And he lost everything in, in this BitGrail hack. The, and he literally took out a loan to invest in this and is saying he is about to lose his house, not have a place to live. His wife doesn't know that this happened yet. And like th this should not be something that is just so predominantly seen in this space. Like people are not being shown what the state of things actually are. They're, they're not being given the, the, the right message when they first get into this space. I mean, like half of, the, half of the public outreach in this space are just people telling you which shit coin you can trade next on a pump to, to get rich. And like, this is not the kind of material that people should be pointed to and exposed to when they first come into this ecosystem, because this is, the complete wild west and if you just throw people in there with the idea that they're going to get filthy rich overnight most of them are going to get financially ruined and i mean to i don't know to, to some degree that like it's a caveat emptor but i mean people in the space should take should feel in some way responsible or obligated to at least try to correct that thing. But uh. yeah, that that Ray Blocks thing is unbelievable. The the withdrawal that they only check to make sure that you had the right balance, client side and JavaScript. So yeah, I mean I, that's if, it's if not confirmed. I just I just found this in the um like while we were on air. But yeah, if this is true, that's insane. Yep, yeah. Just to put this in context, if you're playing like a, a game like Bejeweled or something, they won't keep your current score client side because they don't want you to be able to change it. Um, so if you're able to change your balance client side JavaScript, uh, that is just like, <laughs> I don't know what to say. If that's true, that is absolutely as absurd as any security flaw I've ever heard of. Yeah. I mean, Ray, Ray blocks itself is just uh, like, I was, I was told to like, look at it, uh, for a project, like possibly using uh. it. And I was, I read the white paper and I'm like, there's like a statement in the first few sentences, every user gets their own blockchain. It's like, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> I don't yeah. want my own blockchain. <laughs> Thank you. And Everybody it like all their own internet. And uh, yeah. you just keep that internet in your house and you can. That's called it. an intranet. It's, the interesting it's thing word. Is, <laughs> right. But this is even but better. Like, it's an intranet for one person. It's like a, a one computer internet. Mm -hmm. But um, this this in the show notes is is pretty much just their uh, Nano or Rayblox official response, um, and they're pretty much just trying to distance themselves from the exchange. But one thing I want to point out is like the timing with this rebrand, because Rayblox was actually one of the the shit coins that made it on to CNBC when uh, Brian Kelly was teaching everybody how to buy the top of the shit coin of the week, and like they very quickly after that rebranded and i i find that like very suspect like why you you go on you get shown on, on this major news network like this pump dump and then they rebrand because they know people know the name ray blocks now like they've seen it it's going to be attached to that brian kelly teaching you how to buy the top and then rebrand we're nano now like it's it's the same exact kind of scammy shit that Dash pulled, 
where they, I, I, I forget what it was even originally called, but they insta mined 2 million coins out of thin air. The point I first started messing with it, it was called dark coin. And then by the time they get all this PR movement and presence on the internet going, it's Dash now. And they've gone through a couple different rebrands to obscure themselves from the, the fact that 2 million coins were mined instantly out of thin air when it was first launched. And like, I really think that this should be like a, a telltale sign. When you see coins rebranding themselves, they're scams. Like what reason do you have to just tr quietly try to rebrand your coin in the middle of its lifetime? Yeah, if, if your brand name is the most important thing that you have going on, that's probably not a really exciting piece of uh, new technology. Nano sounds way better, cool, way cooler. So uh, so we'll switch it to that and then we'll see a bump in our market share. That That's definitely like the definition of dumb money at play. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Rayblox is like another example of a thing that for weeks and weeks I was seeing people leaving comments saying Rayblox is going to replace Bitcoin and blah, 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 blah. It's like you guys, like all the people who keep saying that, they really underestimate how hard, you know, I mean, the fact that Bitcoin where it is today, it took so many years, a lot of hard work and dedication from people who, you know, cared about it and the idea that something even if the technology is better uh which i don't believe it is but even if it was that does not remove you of a responsibility to you know <laughs> to prove that you know there's going to be a dedicated community around it and developers who are knowledgeable um like that responsibility isn't gone uh but it's like every time this happens it's like i'm just getting bored of it because eventually it gets proven that these people don't know what they're talking about and they were just being arrogant hubristic yeah i mean like how do you like how do you seriously reconcile in your head everybody gets a blockchain as the way to scale a blockchain system i like that that is just complete and utter insanity I think it's the Nigerian Prince thing all over. They want to exclude anybody with a brain because that just slows them down. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, next piece of news is a little follow up on something we covered recently. Um, it's not entirely confirmed, but at, at least on 8BTC, uh, it's a big Chinese Bitcoin forum. The mining company who partnered with Samsung is being identified as eBank. And for those of you who aren't aware of who they are, this was uh, back around when Dragon Mint was first announced from How Long Mining. And um, 10 nanometer chips meets what's being announced uh, that Samsung is producing. So, I mean, if this is true, it wasn't Bit or it wasn't How Long, but it wasn't Bitmain. So. I'll take it. <laughs> like, anybody besides Bitmain getting shared a new foundry, uh, it's it's good news. More competition, less bullshit to worry about on that front. Yeah, totally. I'm uh, I'm always excited to see any progress or any little announcements on mining. It's it's so slow because it's just one of those things. It's not like pushing out software. It's got to be a really slow process, but uh, it's getting there. Mm -hmm. I still seriously think like they should do some kind of gag reel where one of the miners explodes or something. I don't know if that would be good marketing, but I still think they should do it. <laughs> <laughs> Totally. I don't know if I would want to buy the miner from them after that, but uh, yeah, I know about him. Brian Hoffman, parody video. Oh. Got your next plot. Get on it. Oh gosh. That's I big... want. I want the Brian Hoffman I know and love back. I want my funny videos that just make fun of everybody, no matter what the side, because it's funny. I want that Brian back. Come back to me, Brian. I, I wish I had been around long enough to uh, see the old Brian. He sounds much nicer than 
the more useful than the new Brian. New Brian to seems be, like a bit of an idiot. To to be honest, though, the the people that would be worth parodying are kind of their own best parody because I mean he might be out of a job because they just do such a good job on their own, um, making themselves look ridiculous. So maybe that's why. Yeah, that's true. You can't really parody like Trump very well. And I don't think you can parody like Vitalik. Like he is, he already is like geek spice, right? Like he is the total uh, embodiment of every stereotype that you could, you could imagine. So it's hard to take it any further than that. Ah, I, I, I think you guys underestimate uh, Hoffman's parody video skills. <laughs> All right, send me a link. I'll, I'll give it a shot. It might it might make it less painful next time he shows up in my Twitter feed. Just just make make the block size bigger. It's the core devs problem. Uh uh uh, not in my house. <laughs> oh man. All right. So I guess uh, you guys want to dive into the uh, bank slash political stuff. You can look at all the, the joyous contradictions of bureaucracy. Mm, yummy. So in in one in one fell swoop, the head of the European Central Bank is saying that European banks might start holding Bitcoin. That uh, they might be looking for exposure despite their the risky nature of things and are definitely considering the fact that the uh, the CME, the CBOE, uh, Bitcoin futures being launched are definitely going to be a factor in how Bitcoin kind of starts integrating into and affecting the larger global economy. But he's also um, said before that the ECB does not have the authority to regulate Bitcoin and then went on later to say that cryptocurrencies hadn't matured enough for the ECB to consider regulations. And in another fell swoop, you have France and Germany finance ministers both calling for a global clampdown on Bitcoin. <laughs> it's yeah, like uh, good luck with that. Yeah, but it's like they can't they can't make up their mind. Like <laughs> they're pretty much entire reasoning is substantial risk for consumer investors and then also they're worried about if the capital inflows to the cryptocurrency space continue that it could develop to a size where it actually threatens the larger global economy so like what what are they now, like what's who wrote that article i want to see the author because i have a feeling i know who it is nicholas mcgaugh oh damn nope <laughs> It does kind of remind me of the U.S. Senate hearings recently, right? The last one was super positive, and the one before that was all about money laundering. So I think it's just different competing factions. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think it's people that own Bitcoin and people that don't within the government kind of fighting it out. Um, or people that are about to make a buy, you know, trying to make some negative announcements so they can get cheap Bitcoins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the only explanations I can think of why their opinions are so different is that, I mean... Obviously, we know that <laughs> governments have a coordination problem. They just can't, you know, get their get their motives or plans straight. And so uh, it's possible that it was accidental. And it's just you have different parts of the governments um, saying different things because they've come to different conclusions. Uh, the other possibility is that they purposely want to appear um, as if they're or they they want to put out mixed information uh, on purpose so that people are confused and they don't know what to do. And that in itself is negative news if you don't know which direction um, a specific government or group of governments is going to go, then that might be a uh, reason for FUD. But I'm not sure. Well, honestly, uh, I was kind of talking to JW about this uh, while we were waiting for you guys uh, before we went on air. But I find it kind of interesting that it's france and germany specifically that are calling for this because in terms of the european union they're pretty much the, the two of the big powerhouses and i mean germany especially has a lot of outstanding debt to other european union state members and 
like I like I'm thinking like is there the possibility that this is pretty much just these two countries worried about how further integration of cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin into like the European banking system and markets would kind of offer a lot of other UE states or I mean EU states um, a financial option besides just depending on that. Like that this could kind of upset the balance of individual members in the EU and that they're not really too happy about that. Gosh, that's such a good point, man. I, I kind of missed it when you were talking about it earlier, but there does seem to be a little bit of a pattern here, right? If the US is pro Bitcoin, that would make sense if they, they have a bunch of debt denominated in dollars, right? And if China is not pro Bitcoin, that would make sense because they're the ones holding all of that debt denominated in dollars. So I don't, I don't know how much these guys are willing to kind of sell out central banking to, to have kind of the short term wins. Um, my guess is that it all comes down to like individual actors within the government's trying to figure out what's going to be best for their own personal checkbook. But that is kind of an interesting line of inquiry. Um, that, you know, the governments that are pro Bitcoin, how much, how many of those are debtor nations versus those that aren't. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah, that would be an interesting thing to look at. I'm not, I, I mean, I don't have any concerns about Germany's stance really, because from what I understand it, the German parliament hasn't even really begun uh, to have like conversations about how they should approach cryptocurrencies. And so I, I think this was just the finance minister speaking at, at some kind of event. And I don't, think it re necessarily represents the government as a whole um it sounds like it's way too early to make those kinds of conclusions about whether which direction they'll be going in but uh i wouldn't be surprised if it falls into those kinds of uh differences with debtor nations not wanting to um or the the nations that are in debt wanting to adopt them and the nations that are holding the debt uh not wanting to adopt them well, yeah, I mean, because like I, I actually like really like these kinds of stories, like compared to purely technical topics as much as I love that side of things, because like I really think it is hugely important for people to really think about these dynamics of things, because if like the bigger Bitcoin gets, the more entangled in the, the political economic structures of the world it's going to get. And when you... It's kind of like, you know, watching yourself change. Like if you gain weight or lose weight or like you're getting taller, you don't really notice it because you're just seeing those small, tiny steps one after another. And these are the kinds of things that are very important to pay attention to and notice when they start happening. Because as we get bigger and get more entangled in these power structures, like we're going to like as a, like the cypherpunks like the 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 fucking trolls like the the people who've been in this space since it was a little baby like we're going to be a smaller and smaller piece of the pie and need to work harder and harder to really actually push information out there and actually like try to coordinate to whatever our common goals are and I feel like a lot of people aren't really thinking too in depth about these kinds of dynamics because Bitcoin is going to become something of serious strategic geopolitical importance. If it doesn't, that's because it died. And so we really need to pay attention and keep assessing like how far we've gone in that direction. Because if, if we don't notice that until it's just so glaringly obvious, it's staring us in the face then I'm not really sure how that's going to work out or how well prepared like everybody in this ecosystem and this community is going to be for that. Totally. And to bring that like kind of at a personal level, if you see that if, if this is right, right, if this starts playing out and we're like, yeah, this obviously looks what, like what's happening. The debtor nations love Bitcoin. The creditor nations don't. On a personal level, that's when you start thinking, well, am I a creditor or a debtor, right? Do I have do I have a bunch of businesses or loans out or assets that are denominated in dollars and that stuff is going to be almost worthless when it gets handed to me? Um, or, you know, that's, that's when it gets interesting. Like, am I tempted to go out and take loans that I wouldn't take out otherwise because I really think the value of the dollar is going to go down? 
and then I'll be able to pay it off so cheaply. Um, so yeah, it, it does get pretty, it gets pretty wacky pretty fast, but yeah, you're right. We, we should keep an eye on this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, CMO in the chat just asked, uh, wouldn't China dumping USD for BTC kind of be a, a financial nuclear option? And well, I mean, in, it, in a way, but yeah, go ahead. It, it could, but like, what's that going to accomplish if the US has been stockpiling or has a sizable like stockpile of Bitcoins? All you're going to do is lift everybody in that process as far as at the top of things and you're just going to burn the financial value of everybody at the bottom of the rung. so i mean like yeah that that kind of thing is possible but is that going to get you further away from or closer to your goals as a nation yeah especially if the u.s owes china several trillion u.s dollars and then China, if China was to start adopting Bitcoin, yeah, it would get the United States and everybody else off of the US dollar, which is a bad thing in that sense. But if our debt is big enough, if we have crossed the point where we really don't have any hope of being able to pay off our debt, if everybody abandons US dollars, then um, including us, then we can pay off our debt. It basically eliminates all of our debts, right? Because dollars are worthless now. So that, that would actually serve us well if if we're far enough along and i i mean it seems like we're far enough along down that path because politicians will not talk about the national debt anymore um it, it's it's so off limits in the united states as a politician even mention it when you're running uh for office that maybe that's a sign that we are past the point of uh you know giving up on ever recovering yeah because i mean it's like Greg Maxwell uh, years ago had a post where he kind of talked about how bad it would be if Bitcoin happened too fast. And this is always like one of the go-to things from like the, the Bcash or the RBTC crowd to go, see, he hates Bitcoin. But like, like the, the logic in his reasoning is undeniable. Like the faster Bitcoin grows, the more it starts distorting markets around it, the more it starts becoming a, a, an X factor in geopolitics. And if, if these things steamroll too fast, like you, we could literally see wars being fought over cryptocurrency. And it just, if you think that sounds ridiculous, go look at the, the Petro in Venezuela and look at the claims they're making about that. Like it's like that is, that is possibly something, probably something that is going to cause massive civil unrest down there, if not revolution in some areas. Like it, it's literally just a Ponzi scheme from an idiot socialist dictatorship that doesn't understand cryptocurrencies and thinks they can control one like that it is going to cause massive damage for that country and like personally i think we are at the point where things are happening too fast like that this is progressing at a rate that i would have not believed in a thousand years just a year or two ago Yeah, I, I kind of go back and forth on that because on one hand, if it goes fast, it could be bad for us if we're in living in the heart of the empire and sort of well taken care of. Um, but there's a lot of people that aren't. Um, most people aren't and most people are suffering right now because of the the trade sanctions and all the crazy nonsense that goes around, um, you know, geopolitics right now and uh, the lack of free trade. Uh, you know, all, the, the entire continent of Africa not being able to basically sell any of the stuff that they produce to the U.S. or Europe, um, you, you know, the big consumer nations. So uh, I, I'm, I don't know. I mean, for me personally, I kind of get the point where I'm like, yeah, it'd be nice if it slowed down a little bit. It, this is starting to feel a little uncomfortable. But then when I think about other people that, you know, the average person in the world right now and how much they're suffering under this sort of crazy, um, crazy uh, just network of folks that are running things. I, I, I'm kind of more interested in taking the power out of those guys' hands and just 
um, having a, a more orderly, peaceful world. Even though, gosh, it could be messy in the transition. I can't wait till we're asking ourselves whether the petroleum is in the vaults. <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like an odd concept. Like, why would you want to stockpile petroleum in a vault to back a cryptocurrency? It just doesn't make sense. It's the, like the whole thing doesn't make sense. Hold on, let me let me get. It's this. basically uh, petro futures, though, right? Like the, it's it's like petroleum in the ground that they're gonna dig up at some point in the future. But yeah, it's super dumb. Because okay, if you have me... something like Bitcoin that is like funding the the development and research into you know sustainable sources of energy, you do not want to be stockpiling petroleum. <laughs> Yeah, but yeah. like, let, let me toss this up here. It's a tweet thread that pretty much breaks this down. But like, they're pretty much um, issuing this, and they're they're implying here that um, the origin of a strong currency backed by something was Hugo Chavez's idea. Okay, uh, first ridiculous thing. Um, they're talking about allowing people a means of investment to protect uh, the wealth of the citizens in general. Wow, that's a really innovative idea that they could have never had before. Um, the, yeah, okay, so they're not able to issue new tokens, but um, reserves the right to activate new things like proof of stake emission or maybe proof. Of, so they can't issue more tokens, but they can um, with proof of work or proof of stake. Um, I'll, I will remind everybody that this is literally just an ERC-20 token. Um, here, here is the math, I guess, to figure out how much they're worth with oil. Um, the, the rate will be controlled by <laughs> exchange houses authorized by the Venezuelan government because they can totally just prevent this from being moved or traded anywhere else like they 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 can totally lock down the the price of a cryptocurrency um like this this whole thing is is insane like this is a government pulling an ICO scam on their entire population I like how it says it won't accept Bolivars. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, the, the, the other part. Yeah, it's like, we it's don't like, oh. take money that's worth something. <laughs> uh, we're not going like to take those shit tokens. We're, we're not accepting those. This shit like, token you know, is so much less shitty than the Bolivar shit token that we, we won't trade for. <laughs> yeah, it's like if you thought the Bolivar was worth shit before, it's really worth shit now. The government won't even take it. But yeah, like this is scary. Like this, this is things happening too fast. Like it is. I, I don't know. It's, I don't think they're actually doing anything. Uh, it'd be surprised if they actually release it uh, or if it goes anywhere. I think it's just stupid PR. Dude, JW, people will trade the pump. They'll, they'll buy it, they'll pump it. Like they're going to definitely try that, that like um i believe they they went to qatar to try to discuss the use of this um to bypass sanctions so they're definitely going to be looking for actual like foreign liquidity to some degree no, you're, you're like, right man i mean my my universe doesn't have room for ethereum let alone ripple so yeah you're probably right it'll probably do something like it's like this is not gonna go well and like this has never happened before like what the hell are the consequences that could come of this i have no earthly idea but i can't imagine any of them being good all right some good news for those who like to practice uh financial sovereignty uh, Chris Belker, one of the, the joint market developers, has released the alpha for Electrum Personal Server. And this is pretty awesome. If, if you're an Electrum user that uh, actually uses your own node, you know that you have to run an entire server instance over it that has the transaction database and an address database that's way more resource intensive than just the node. 
You know, we've, so have, have you gotten an ad blocker? Oh my God. It's, just, it's <laughs> fun. Okay. I don't know. The, yes. the cryptocurrency fund of funds. What does that even mean? It's, he he it does have an ad blocker. It. It's your ad blocker plus up in the right It's corner. your ad oh, blocker. You block it's origin. Brain. You block origin. Not ad block okay. plus. Ad block okay. plus is a white list, which is probably Back. why you're seeing it. <laughs> back, back, <laughs> back to business, okay? The Electrum personal server is a nice little bridge between the actual Electrum wallet and your full node. So what it'll do is it'll grab your master public key and use that as a watch-only wallet with Bitcoin Core. So if it's a previously existing wallet, it'll have to rescan the whole blockchain. Is if you're running a prune node, that might be a bit of a pain in the ass. But with a, a brand new wallet, it won't have to do this. And you can use Electrum directly with your full node without all the bloat that comes with the actual Electrum server and get hardware wallet support directly with your Bitcoin Core node, all the advanced features that Electrum offers. And this is pretty awesome. This is making it uh, a lot less of a pain in the ass to take a hardware wallet for key management and use this directly with your full node. So you get the, the security of full validation, the privacy of only asking your node about your transactions and addresses. Like this, if you have a computer that can physically run a Bitcoin core node, I highly suggest you tinker with this. If you're using a hardware wallet, Obviously, even though it's an alpha, unless you confirm something on your hardware wallet, you should have no risk of losing your money. But security, privacy, woo. Yeah, I mean, I think since now the ads have come into the conversation, I think this is a good time to talk about the fact that government websites all around the world are um unbeknownst to them mining cryptocurrency on their websites <laughs> including the nhs and the manchester city council and apparently somewhere in australia as well um doesn't doesn't <laughs> get fun doesn't get funnier than that <laughs> totally that so so yes the, the government the government is um mining but probably not for them they're not stockpiling <laughs> they're just you know, kidding you know the ecb did say that they wanted to start you know collecting bitcoin and holding it right so man this is like uh, cryptocurrency is going to be the, the scourge of the internet that burns away all the unclean insecure things i love it it just goes to show that the government doesn't really exist Right. Like th this guy probably works for the government, right? He's got a job there in some building and he shows up every day, but he's in it to win it just like everybody else. And uh, just because he puts on a, a funny badge or a funny hat, he'll still fire up a miner on that hardware if it gets him a few bucks. Yeah. There's someone in the chat who just said taxpayer funded mining. It's like if you <laughs> first instance of taxpayer funded mining. Probably not the first, but. Yeah, very probably, obvious. There's probably a nuclear power plant firing up somewhere. Well, I mean, it's well, just I mean, like they've, it's... Been using, they've been using state taxes for that. So, I mean, it's it, it's a good thing. Hey, guess what? Now you can literally make money in, in a way that shows security holes, and the company can't ignore it because they look stupid as fuck when they get caught. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it does put a uh, it puts a bounty on every uh, every computer with a processor in it. Okay, and I guess um, breaking news: um, we bring you Roger Ver to um, tell you the truth that we're paid operatives uh, out to undermine Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> Dude, I'm it's sorry, Bitcoin but... Cash Plus. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> For the rest of time, I will not be able to take someone seriously who's wearing a bitch please t-shirt. <laughs> like, 
there's no way that that was not intentional. I know what you're referencing, Roger. I can I cannot take you seriously wearing a bitch please t-shirt. That is just like no, not happening. I think on the back of the shirt it has somebody like snapping their fingers, doesn't it? BCH, please. Well, didn't you know Bitcoin Core Network is in trouble due to high fees and slow transaction times? Bitcoin Cash is the upgrade that solves these problems. <laughs> uh, but yeah, yeah. So I didn't, I didn't get to watch most of the interview. I only watched part of it, but it was just so hilarious. Like, like that. I mean, one of my predictions was that Roger Ver's um roger verse conspiracy theories would be too crazy for alex jones and there was some time there was a few times where alex jones kind of played along but there was a few occasions where he seriously looked skeptical and it was like the funniest thing ever <laughs> making alex jones look skeptical oh yeah he, his entire face through the whole thing just screamed to me oh my god I can't take a side i have no idea how my audience is divided on this i can't afford to lose viewers the fence the fence you could see how uncomfortable he was so much so that i felt uncomfortable it was great i just thought it was like the funniest part to me was like two of the three callers just called up and just called him out on his bullshit i think the the first one uh called him out for selling explosives on the internet and storing them in an apartment building uh, the second viewer called out Jihan's involvement and pretty much B Cash is a giant scam. And Roger's response twice, I think, in the whole interview was there's a very good chance that th- these are just paid operatives attempting to undermine Bitcoin Cash. <laughs> like, just in a live interview, somebody disagrees with him or calls him out on his bullshit, and he's just paid operative. I mean, like, I don't know whether to think that he just did that trying to play to the InfoWars crowd or if that was, like, his actual thought process as, as that happened live. I, I love the idea that, like, you could go on there and you could tell everybody everybody watching that, like, you've, you've seen, you were there at the alien autopsy, right? And, and you can move things with your mind. And, you know, no big deal. But Roger gets on there and tries to tell people that Bitcoin Cash is amazing and it's just... Even that audience is just fed up with the the lunacy. I mean, I'm pretty sure the callers were people from Bitcoin land who might not watch uh, Alex Jones all the time. But it's just like the the fact that like Alex pretty much just like started getting more and more nervous <laughs> after like everybody just called in pretty much completely against Roger's point of view. And after his first comment is like, this is a paid operative. This is a paid operative to to stop Bitcoin cash. When when somebody calls in and goes, I don't like you. (laughs) I mean, after the Reddit cost effective. After the Reddit and the Twitter debates, I mean that's just the best thing ever. That's I love it. Yeah, it's like it. I just I don't I don't know what's going through his head. Like for for those who watched the Ruben Report interview, uh, the TLDR is he cited Luke Jr.'s node figures when Ruben was skeptical of there being enough redundancy. Um, he he went immediately to mesh networks, which are there's no way that's working with a terabyte block. Are what will do if the government decides to start filtering or shutting down the internet he, he pretty much just starts resorting to all air quote core data to convince ruben that bitcoin is a sound enough idea and then started rambling about how assassination markets are going to bring about utopia and i mean then now he goes or I, I believe in the middle there too he tried tagging joe rogan multiple times on twitter to get on the joe rogan podcast and now he's gone on Infowars and pretty much just immediately gone to the person on the phone who disagrees with me is a paid show. And it's like, I, does he have any perception of like others as the, like how others see him? Like, does he have any idea how his actions are perceived? Like it's insane. Well, 
I mean, I would be embarrassed to be on a radio show that plays ads like every five minutes, especially when one of those ads is male and female vir virility or vir vitality or whatever it was. <laughs> <laughs> that, was <laughs> that is the bottom of the media barrel when, when that's your sponsor. And it's like, it's not even a separate product. It's like a special thing made by Alex Jones. It's like, who the hell would want to buy that kind of thing from Alex Jones? Not me. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I do wonder if it was cost effective, though. Like, I, I imagine that he probably paid Alex to be on the show. And I do wonder if he got enough Bitcoin cash buyers to offset the cost. Um Oh, well, I mean, he definitely, he definitely organized the price increase right before, like there's, yeah. there's no other reason why the Bitcoin cash price would go up right before the interview, unless he wanted to conveniently make it the only current, the uh, only cryptocurrency that was um, in the green during the show. And all the other ones are negative. And it's like, look, Bitcoin cash price is the one that's increasing. It's like, no, Roger, it actually just crashed by like more than 50% in like the two weeks before you did this interview. And the only reason it went up is because you probably got a lot of your buddies to pump it right before the interview to make it look attractive. But it is definitely not something that, uh, that I would be encouraging people to buy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, e even Jihan Wu is still going around Twitter going, Bitcoin Cash is Bitcoin Cash, and, and pretty much like distancing himself from Bcash is the one true Bitcoin. But it's just like, Roger just keeps like throwing money at like PR attempts that are just looking worse and worse and worse and worse for him. And I just like, why does he keep this up? Like what rational person at this point just continues beating their head on the wall and expecting something different to happen? I just think that's so cute of Ji Han Wu to do that. Like I'm surprised he's still doing that. I'm I I would think that Craig Wright or Roger would have told him by now that that's not something they should be doing because that undermines their argument that Bitcoin Cash is the real Bitcoin. Um, so I don't. It's just so cute that he's still doing that. Speaking of uh, Craig Wright and bad PR, I guess Craig Wright took credit for having paid for that music video that we all enjoyed a couple weeks ago. So the, the mystery solved. He he definitely is proud that he did it. So that's Wait, so what Chain is spending their money on. <laughs> there's a hair somewhere. I can't remember, but there's a hair and Craig Wright's responsible for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I'm surprised because, you know, Craig Wright must be like forking over a lot of money to keep renting that Lambo of his. But I guess he found the the finances to hire a band that was apparently too embarrassed to use their real faces or names to sing the song. That, that's the mystery to me, like how as much like chaos and destruction that these guys are creating with Bitcoin Cash are they really not getting enough to be able to buy a Lambo? Like, obviously that's very important to them. I would really like to know how profitable this whole, uh, just melee has been. I don't see how, like, look, <clears throat> look at the hash rates between the two right now. Like Bitcoin's 20 something X a hash versus Bcash is three. I mean. Yeah. Like... And if you go to, to <laughs> if you, if you go to total work, you'll really see the disparity. Look at that. Yep. Woo. It's like half. Yeah, half like you, you think they'd be buying the Lamborghini, right? Or at least doing their research and buying a fancy car that holds its value year over year. That hasn't been done. That, that that's yeah, that's that's uh weird. Well, it's just like I, I like I seriously question what is going through Craig Wright's head? How he is pulling off what he is pulling off, and what the hell N Chain's like business model is. Like he he his entire narrative is Blockstream, this evil company abusing patents. Um, they they have all their patents in a defensive sharing agreement and have never once abused them. Uh, is is going to kill Bitcoin? So come be a fanboy of. My company that's patenting a bunch of stuff, but is totally not going to abuse this and will let Bitcoin Cash use it. 
Like, and Shane, does... <laughs> and Shane is definitely a patent troll. That's nothing to be ashamed of. Apparently. Yeah, it's like I. It's like how do people like just accept that with no criticism? Like it's it's literally like stepping back the entire time I have been in this space since like 2013. Like it's literally like their entire strategy in a nutshell is literally just accuse them of what we're doing first. And then they just the social dynamic of that. Like if, if I call you a fucking rapist, like what, what how's it going to look and be perceived when you just go, no, you're the rapist. Like it's, I said it first, I get the punch. I get the assumption of credibility in that degree. And it's literally like all they've been doing like for years is just accuse other people of doing the thing that they're themselves doing before the other person can point it out. That's literally it. Like that, that's the entirety of how they engage publicly. So someone in the chat says, uh, they're talking about which is the true Lambo, old Lambos or new Lambos, which is the true vision of Lamborghinis. There is no true Lambo, only your Lambo. I just think Treat the, uh, the scarcity, right? Like the old ones were like kind of tractor parts merged with stuff on a, on a frame with fiberglass. And, you know, they, they were very unique. They were in limited numbers, you know, and they were scary to drive and they had tons of character. And it's kind of going away from that. And the, the numbers are in much higher quantities. So like they're not even that rare um, in comparison. So, I mean, those cars have like gained a lot of value. And um, I don't know if like current Lambos do, for example, like the one that was rented. Certain examples I'm sure do, but you know, again, the rare ones, right? Yeah, I just think that the whole idea of renting a Lambo is like a teenager wearing his dad's gold watch to the dance. Like it doesn't work. It's only a status symbol if it's yours. If it's rented, it's just a pathetic, like, you know, attempt to look like you have more money than you do. And it's obvious to everybody. Well, isn't that pretty and much what all pointless fancy things are? Also, like, isn't it a huge risk to not only be a person whose face is all of the internet as someone who attempted to prove he was Satoshi and might have a lot of Bitcoin and runs a big company? And, like, I, if I was him, like, I would not want to be driving around in an expensive car <laughs> and tweeting pictures of it. Like, here's my location, guys. I visited this museum today. Here's my Lambo. Come get me. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't try to kidnap him because I'd be like, well, if it's a rented Lambo, he's the last person on my list. But I, I don't know if you can really count on the average guy that's gonna <laughs> gonna try to kidnap you for money, uh, thinking that many layers deep. So yeah, I agree. That's pretty damn risky. Well, apparently if he was in San Francisco, he'd be even more trouble because San Francisco is apparently suffering a um increasing rate of carjackings because the police are completely unwilling to um, help people get their cars back and especially rental cars. So I hope he never goes to San Francisco because if he does, he'll be really screwed. <laughs> Pays all those costs to ship his Lambo and then poof. Be funny to see uh, Craig Wright go crying to the police to get his Lambo back though. You mean more than he's already crying to a fitness company about them sending him broken products, apparently? Because that's what he's just sending us. <laughs> I mean, I can't wait. I would, I would love to see that because if he's you know, willing to complain publicly about broken products on Twitter while the Bitcoin cash price is like dropping down by large percentages along with Bitcoin, um, yeah, I would probably be complaining to fitness companies too. Why do all the funny people to watch on Twitter ban me? Why? Uh, well, because you're vocal and you like get them involved in the thread and I try to stay out of threads so that I don't get blocked and then I can see every what everyone is saying. But but Twitter is for trolling. Isn't, isn't that the whole reason for it? Have I been living a lie my entire life? 
Well, your name is I Troll, so you would probably be really pro <laughs> you would probably be really prone to getting blocked. <laughs> All right, double, all right, all right. Double whammy. All right, reality check. So. Oh, and this. just as a side note, apparently uh, Craig Wright's Lambo license plate is in the picture that he tweeted. Great job, dude. <laughs> Great optic. <laughs> nice. All right, wow. now, this is probably one of the most important things going on regarding cryptocurrencies right now in my opinion um apparently the true name system in south korea is kind of not integrating with a lot of smaller exchanges and hasn't really had that big of an uptick uh since it was started to be rolled out there's pretty much only 10% of anonymous uh, exchange accounts switching over to the true name system. And only a few major exchanges um, such as Upbit, BitThumb, Coining, and Corbit uh, actually integrating with the bank systems. So um, it's being challenged or was being challenged in Korea's constitutional court um, as a violation of people's property rights. And this has now officially been moved up to uh, South Korea's Supreme Court. So right now, um, the, the case, I think, was limited to 160 or 180 days. So it should be done by June. But all of the regulations just instituted by the South Korean government are now being challenged at literally the highest level of their government on a constitutional basis. And I think that this is going to be a very important precedent set, globally speaking, depending on which way the court ruling goes and kind of how South Korean society reacts to this. But like this, this is important. And, you know, just, just imagine it, if this goes successfully if a, a government's crypto regulations are pretty much just slapped down due to a challenge on, on a constitutional basis, that leaves that door open it's pretty much to any constitutionally based country with uh, rights that would entitle them to make that argument. And that is a very powerful thing that I think doesn't really fit in really the hardcore crypto anarchist mindset of the government's just going to go away one day. Like that is an option. I think that, it, I mean, it's, it's inevitable to start happening. It's, it's already happened in one place. And like, I don't know. How, how do you feel about that? JW? Well, I mean, I, I think like from a crypto anarchist perspective, it's not that we don't, acknowledge that governments exist right it's just that we see them as a, just a group of individuals right like a company exists google exists but really if you're trying to figure out what it's going to do you look at the individual actors in play right like are they going to release this code on time well what's the incentive for these specific software developers to do that right um you don't just look at it as like this big monolith um and you don't buy into the pr right so um, for example, the Supreme Court's going to do what it's going to do, but I don't believe that the Supreme Court of any country is going to act based on what's in the on the paper, right? What's on the paper is almost irrelevant. Uh, what matters is the political reality, right? And what their own personal incentives are. I, I will say I'm shocked that there's even a possibility that the people in South Korea have this much freedom, um, that, uh, that the idea that they could buy and sell Bitcoin without being bagged and tagged, um, you know, as, as meat bag, uh, human assets, uh, the way that we are in the United States is pretty, pretty encouraging actually. Cause I would not have expected that that was even a possibility. Uh, the article said as of now, only, um, slightly less than 10% of all of the accounts, um, are converted, you know, and, and tagged with their real names. So that's incredible. I mean, that's a hundred percent at Coinbase, right? It's a hundred percent at, at any U S based exchange because of, uh, KYC regulations. So that's that's pretty cool um but yeah as far as what these guys are going to do i don't know and and i would say that eventually when cryptocurrencies get popular enough there won't be the political will 
to make them illegal. And that's when we would see something like the U.S. Supreme Court say, yes, you know, the Constitution says um, that we can't regulate it. Um, the Constitution of the United States has been a laughing stock for at least 100 years now. So the whole idea that that there's anything other than political realities playing out with those guys in Moomoo's, I think, is is a little naive. But uh, but yeah, I'm encouraged in general that this is even being discussed. Well, maybe it just goes to show that despite all their flaws, freedoms are not completely dead everywhere that people think they are. Yeah, I mean, I, I I don't think they're dead. I just think that when they exist, they don't exist because of a piece of parchment. They exist because um, because the people won't put up with the garbage, right? And and governments know that they have to um, they have to keep people happy one way or another, or at least they have to keep them under control. And uh, and there's always so few of them compared to the people that they can only push people so far. What's cool is that the people of South Korea apparently will put up with a lot less crap than we will. So that's that's an insight that's definitely encouraging either way. I think this is a good time to show the new open dime t-shirt. What, what, what? They, they got a cool new shirt and I haven't got one yet. I need one. <laughs> that's what? awesome. Yeah. The only oversight I need is my full mode. <laughs> Nailed it. I I think I so we don't quite tight. This one we should uh, when we when we should soft fork and the sensor transactions is that what that T-shirt's telling me? Coin kite needs to stop making cool things because they're making me spend my Bitcoin. I I they need to stop making me spend my Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, they they have been cranking out some cool stuff i i definitely flipped them some crap for enabling litecoin uh on twitter but but i'll give them credit or credits do it does seem like they're building some really cool stuff lately yeah i mean i my opinion on why i think this happened in the supreme court in south korea is because you actually had a bit of an uprising which uh happened when uh, the finance minister uh, was trying to ban cryptocurrencies and a bunch of South Koreans were like, no way, dude, <laughs> that's not happening. And they actually protested about it, which was amazing because uh, I don't know if you would see something like that happening in the U.S. I don't, it, which is, um, which is kind of sad, but yeah, that's uh, probably not going to happen. Yeah, they were protesting and it scared people in the government enough to where they were making some pretty good strong statements that they wouldn't do anything like that. So yeah, it it would it would be a natural progression for the government to to do something a little bit more formal and say, hey, you know, don't worry, your constitutional rights protect this. We'll never mess with it. Just because they don't want they don't want a fake news story to end up resulting in a coup. Yeah, well, I mean it's like if you look at part of the rationalization from the the recent SEC CFTC hearing, it was I mean I believe what Giancarlo said was pretty much we owe it to the younger generations to not stamp out like the, the space as it's growing, and I mean like really unpack and think about that. Like we owe it to the next generations to try to make this thing work. Why? Because things as they are now are not going to. And I mean, that's really kind of illuminating, I think, at least in that room of the mindset a lot of, of a lot of those people is this is maybe one of the only alternative options to just keep driving the car to the cliff until we fly off. And like, that's not the reaction I think that a lot of people would expect from governments around the world. I think they would expect something along the lines of France and Germany of you ban this, like or China, like get this the hell out of here. But I don't really think that's going to be the predominant attitude among a lot of governments. I think it's going to be the, the ray of hope in the situation where they were previously just completely fucked. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, it's also disagree. it's also possible he's kind of being patronizing with that because, like, the thing that stood out to me during I don't know if it was him who said it, but one of them was like referring to their thirty-year-old kid, and I get it. Some parents refer to their adult children, uh, their adult um, offspring as kids, but it just seemed kind of weird that he was calling his thirty-year-old daughter a kid. Um, I guess she would be a kid to him, but she's not a kid. Like she's an adult. Um, and so I don't, I don't, I don't know. I definitely don't, I'm not going to like let my guard down and think, oh, this is a sign that the U S government is going to like be, be open to cryptocurrencies, like seriously disrupting the financial system. Like that's, that's, I don't know whether it's cause it's kind of hard to tell. Um, I think that any time that they would be, kind of praising cryptocurrencies as if they expect to develop one of their own and try to make that you know more popular than one of these other cryptocurrencies like bitcoin that they don't control so i'm i'm not i, I mean i found it interesting that they were willing to speak so positively at least on the on the face of it about bitcoin but i'm not going to like i'm not going to become less paranoid about um what they could potentially do yeah, it could turn either way, um, but you're you're gonna see you're gonna you would expect to see a kind of a, a chaotic mix of responses, right? If if he is trying to get more public support, right? I mean, how, when was the last time the head of the CFTC was even known by like more than seven people? Um, so it was obviously a good move for him to hold these hearings and then uh, say good things about Bitcoin. Like he, he drummed up a lot of support. Now that doesn't in any way mean that he won't use that support to do something evil that puts money in his pocket, right? Like make a really negative announcement about Bitcoin and then buy it. Um, and it certainly doesn't mean that there's other people in the CFTC that don't have different angles that they're working. Um, so th that's the problem with trying to figure out what quote government does is it's this big pile of people that all have different agendas and different, um, uh, sort of different timelines and, and different uh, scams that they're playing. Um, and, you know, occasionally there's a guy like Ron Paul that maybe wasn't playing a scam for the time that he was in, but by far the majority of them are. So you just assume they're all scammers. They're all scamming each other. They're all scamming us. And then everything kind of, you know, makes sense more or less. Yeah, but I mean, think about the dynamic of a scammer when everything comes home to roost in the presence of a, a solution that can to a degree save their ass. Are they just going to ignore it? I don't think so in most of their cases. Yeah. If I was the very last head of the, the fed, um, and I, I could, I could say, Hey, you know, it's Bitcoin's fault. It's not our fault, but we just didn't know how to stop the new technology. And this stuff started 15 years before I got here. Yeah. That's totally a good play. Already then. Ready to move on to the next one? Take that as a yes. Yes. All right. This is a pretty awesome breakdown from uh, No Para. Uh, he loves pizza. If you wanna, you wanna buy him a little pizza. This man does a lot of underappreciated work in the space. Pretty much breaking down all of the current privacy technologies going on. And he pretty much breaks them down into the network level and the blockchain level. But um, just to kind of go over things really quick, we've had uh, Dandelion, which is uh, something that the core developers are working on. It's kind of an onion routed uh, transaction relay protocol so that it's a lot harder to tag a transaction to any individual origin node. Um, a lot of work, um, I think Nopar is actually one of the first ones to actually get this out there, or the first um, in his hidden wallet, a full block SPV mode so that you're not doing anything but requesting full blocks from other nodes, um, not really giving them any basis to identify your addresses, so, so kind of protecting things on the network level. Uh, he goes a little into Neutrino. Uh, it's kind of a client side uh, replacement for bloom filters um, as they're done now, which are not really too good on the privacy front. And then CoinJoin and how that can filter in um, 
with confidential transactions and really start making kind of on-chain privacy a lot more cost effective when you have things bundled up together. And in the context of Bitcoin, the main chain itself functioning more for settlement of secondary layers, I don't think it takes too many jumps in imagination to really get to the point where you can see how that would very quickly become something people would prefer to use, whether they're intentionally trying to stay private or not. And obviously Schnorr signatures, which is next up on the horizon. But I, I really think everybody should break this down. And uh, like I said, yeah, got a little bit by the man of pizza because this is one of the people most dedicatedly working on actual privacy that can be practically, practically implemented without contention or a bunch of drama behind it. And that's something that this space desperately needs. And, you know, as we've seen over the past couple months with all of these robbery, um, kidnapping incidents with crypto people who are a little too public, um, you're not going to want to learn the hard way that privacy is something that you should have taken seriously from the beginning. Yeah, no doubt. Um, you know, if you've, if you've spent $10,000 today, you might be thinking, don't worry about it. You know, uh, nobody's going to worry about trying to track me down or take advantage of me in any way. But, um, but if you spent $10,000, $10,000 five years ago, right. That you got to think about how much that would be worth now. And, uh, how much is that going to be worth in five years? And, and you, you need to apply the amount of security and privacy that uh, is appropriate for whatever that future dollar amount is because you don't get to redo it right it's not something you can go do retroactively you can't say in two years oh my gosh this ten thousand is now a hundred thousand and i need to take appropriate steps it doesn't work like that so um kind of pick what you think it's going to be at in the future i would say a million dollars a coin is not unreasonable um if if it works if it doesn't it's going to zero if it works it's going to be global money and there's only 21 million of these things to go around so uh so it's not unreasonable to say all right it's a million bucks a coin and apply that level of paranoia and privacy and security to to what you're doing mm -hmm. and speaking of privacy jeff garzik why is your United Bitcoin fork demanding your name, phone number, date of birth, and email to not have your coins confiscated? Like, I mean, like this man has repeatedly denied doing any kind of work in chain analytics. Like, he is full of shit. Like, point blank. He is completely and utterly full of shit. Yeah, he's a scammer and a bad guy, right? There's no question about it. He's been involved with a lot of the major attacks on Bitcoin, and this is just the latest one. And uh, what pisses me off is that if other people fall for this, right? If you if you sent somebody a tip for five bucks um, on Twitter at one point, and they go and they register because they want to get their free shit coins, then they have exposed you um uh potentially and your identity right and that can that stuff can be triangulated and eventually figured out and that's obviously the intention here so this this bitcoin unlimited scam they're going to create the most valuable database of bitcoin holders ever right other than maybe coinbase right and hopefully coinbase you know they're idiots but hopefully they're not flat out scammers the way garzik obviously is um, but as far as, you know, a database that's immediately in the hands of people that lie, cheat and steal on a regular basis and are total bastards, this thing is it, man. So if you're, uh, if you're putting your information in there, screw you. And, uh, if I ever gave you a tip and you put your information in there, screw you even more. Yeah. Cause I mean, like, that's like, when you give up your privacy, you're damaging everybody else's privacy as well, because now there's less things that are uncertain in their connections when people are digging through the chain or metadata for things. So it's it's not as simple as, oh, like, I, I'm doing something with no effect on others. Like, this very much does affect others. Yeah, especially if you were um, 
you know, if you've used your Bitcoin to pay people or something like that, if, or you've been paid by other people, then that would make it easier to figure out the identities of others. Like pretty much everyone that I've shown this to has burst out laughing. Like they do not see how, like this could not be a more blatant attempt to uh, de-anonymize Bitcoin users. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that's the half of like, I mean, in Bcash's case, like we have one interesting data set, at least half of the coins right now, last I checked, are moved and so within the user's control. But like each successive fork is just narrowing the margin of error more and more for who is controlling what coins on the Bitcoin blockchain. Like when you clone a chain, all of that analytics data is equally applicable for a period to the other one. Yeah, so I, I seriously, I'm going to propose right now that we dirty his database and just put false information. Like it's so, f it would be so easy to do that. Just grab a bunch of addresses, put them in there. Like, let's do it. I seriously think we should do some kind of campaign to just randomly put bad data. Absolutely. In yep, that is brilliant. Good job, Janine. That's totally what, what we need to do. And we need to encourage everybody else to do the same thing on Twitter and uh, Reddit and whatever. Just put garbage data in there, make that database useless um, so that it, it's harder to dig through that data than it would be just to look at the at the blockchain itself. That would be yeah. hell of a... What's your What's our hashtag be sick of Garzik? I have no uh, idea. Uh, no, it's got to, how about, um, uh, it's got to have something to do with privacy. Um, but yeah, we should, we should think about it. Uh, hit us up in the troll box and give us suggestions, but I want to emphasize. Buddy Waters. And if anybody has a problem with that, you have no taste in music. <laughs> But it's some, something that shows that if you out yourself, you're outing me too, right? So maybe, maybe something that can kind of emphasize that, like, cause, cause it is sort of like the, the vaccination thing, right? Like if you're around little babies and you don't get vaccinated, you're a piece of crap. And if you're, uh, if you're putting your information in here, then you're a piece of crap. Sick of, sick of you 2X. <laughs> I don't know. We'll we'll figure it out and we'll we'll get that out there. But great idea, oh, though. Man. That's exactly the right thing to do. Fucking Garzik. I mean, like there there are not many people in this space. I will definitively say are acting on malicious intent. Jeff Garzik is one of them. I mean, like there is absolutely no comprehensible reason to have set this up this way other than to get people's private information like none whatsoever and yeah, i don't even there's, know there's no reason for it there's absolutely no application of this data other than things you wouldn't want them to apply it to and i don't even know like how this is being applied because if i mean do, I'm assuming that in order to get access to your United Bitcoins, you not only have to KYC yourself, but you actually have to control the keys that you're claiming to own. Uh, but is it possible that the people who sign up will be like, because if they can just, you know, redistribute um, coins, that means that people's control of their own private keys is really like broken. It's like not real control. So like, would it be possible for people to sign up to this thing and like claim other people's keys? Like that seems, I, I'm not sure how this thing works, but I would not be surprised if that was the case. Yeah, that's a good point. If you do have to prove that you have ownership of your Bitcoin, the way you did with Bitcoin Cash, then um, going and putting garbage data in there might backfire in the sense that they could still have your IP um, and some other things, and maybe they're, they're everybody can just give all their keys to me after they move them on the main chain. Give me all the United Bitcoin. There we go. <laughs> that's not a that's not a bad idea at all. Move your Bitcoin and then then send your send it to us. Uh, send us your old private keys, and we'll put garbage data in for you. <laughs> James James <laughs> James James Bond just said he's going to register as Osama bin Laden. <laughs> <laughs> James Bond is back. <laughs> Register as Roger Ver. Make it seem like Roger Ver has a whole lot more Bitcoin unlimited or whatever that United that he does. 
No, what I think we should do is we should do a play on like what all these scammers on Twitter have been doing by like changing one character in people's names and like creating accounts to ask for money. What we should do is we should all we should use the name Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> we should use Satoshi Nakamoto, but change the letters slightly, like find all the iterations of Satoshi Nakamoto and then send that to <laughs> send that to United Bitcoin and just sign up with all these iterations of the Satoshi Nakamoto name. Yeah, but that would be easy to clean out. So we want it to be as messy as possible. We should probably go out to like public domain registries and just grab real people's info and throw it in there. Yeah, that's true. I mean, we like we could just find multiple different ways to spam them with data. Yep, totally. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully they're uh, hopefully they're not not making sure that you have control of the keys when you register. We'll have to play around with that. Mm -hmm. Alrighty then. Um... Sad news for uh, Slovenians. Apparently, a, uh, a savings bank there was actually directly selling Bitcoin through its ATMs since September and recently uh, had to shut this down at the direction of their central bank. Even though there is no clear actual legislative reason for forcing them to shut down. And... The reason giving is the central bank officials, the running team here, say cryptocurrencies could pose a systemic risk to financial stability if the amount poured into them continued to grow. So, yeah, that's uh, it's pretty shitty. Gone from being able to literally buy Bitcoin at the bank to... No bueno, because it could destroy the world economy in, what, five months? <sighs> yeah, right. but again, who, who's, who's putting in a buy order just before this announcement, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, yeah. Like, like I said, this is like the same kind of bullshit as Golden Sachs. So it's a Ponzi scheme. All right, guys, start getting the trading day set up and, and buy, buy, buy. Totally. Chase Bank, same thing. Mm -hmm. And then once they have it, it's it's a great idea. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna change the world now that I've got my my holdings. Oh well, I mean, it's kind of an aspect of the system as much as people probably don't want to hear it in this context it's permissionless uh anybody can buy it yeah all right who's ready who's ready for the the insanity to continue i love the insanity may it continue berkeley california is Considering doing an ICO for less dependence on federal funding in the Trump administration. <sighs> and specifically because the new tax bill passed removed um, some stipulations that make it more expensive to build cost-effective housing. And so they're going to potentially start this ICO to raise a bunch of money and put together affordable housing because the amount of homeless people in the area is rising. <laughs> and um, the, the one thing I wanted to point out from this article I thought was pretty funny. Uh, forgive me if you're of a different political persuasion. Berkeley is the center of the resistance. And for the resistance to work, it must have a coin. Ben Bartlett from, from the city council told Business Insider. That, oh my that, gosh, they're such that clowns. That reminds me of that catchphrase that the revolution will be monetized. <laughs> <laughs> totally. <laughs> well, that's actually like a sensical or sensible statement. This this is just, just yeah, clowns like JW said. <laughs> I think what he meant is for the resistance to work for me and put money in my pocket, we must have a coin. I think that was in parentheses. I mean, I'm I'm just kind of surprised that you know uh, this group of people would would be uh, they would realize that money isn't an important 
uh, tool for this kind of thing. Uh, it's like, haven't we been telling them that for years now? They're like, they're just trying to, like a lot of them are against the financial system for different reasons. And so I'm surprised that they have decided. I wonder what the coin will be. Do you think it'll be proof of work? Do you think they'll be mining it? Oh, or no, it's no, it going to no. be some kind oh, of... Oh, they'll just have total control. It's going to be like an ERC-20 token because that just works perfectly. Berkeley and uh, Ethereum, that's a match made in heaven, baby. Can't wait to see the Burke ticker. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is it will probably be the least scammy ICO in existence, which is kind of ironic since the government is one big scam. But compared to the stuff that's going on in ICOs right now, it'll actually be pretty sound. I'm just kind of wondering, like, how is this going to work? Like, are the students going to be buying these tokens or what What the hell? How? Who's buying this? Like, what's the, what's their user it's, base? It's pretty much uh, going to be backed by municipal bonds. Um, so they're, they're literally just trying to create an ICO for um, liabilities <laughs> held by the city. For wait, wait a second. Uh, is it Jane? Jane said the quote, initial community offering will differ from traditional initial coin offerings. First, I like that they <laughs> decide to call it initial community offering. That makes it sound so much more pleasant. But like, since when are initial coin offerings traditional? Like, what is this use of the word traditional? <laughs> we literally, the, the word ICO did not exist prior to what, 2016-ish? Maybe 2015 with Ethereum. I don't know how, but I did not hear the term before 2016. How in the hell can something be only, a concept be only two years old and it be called traditional? It was like um, uh, like a year or two ago, there was this article about how the traditional blockchain was decentralized and they wanted to go away from the traditional mods. Like, are you, f like, I wouldn't even consider 10 years to be <laughs> something that could be labeled traditional. Like, what is this use of the word traditional? It doesn't make sense. The whole thing is just like silly and like to a much smaller degree, much, much smaller. Just it's, it, it feels the exact same way as Venezuela launching the Petro. Like you just, like, I, I, I do think that cryptocurrencies are going to be an exacerbant and an agitator in causing different political groups to just shrink in size over time. I, I do think that, that governments will just naturally trend towards smaller and more fragmented. But this, to me, looks like the first group to try it are just going to be people going full retard and just completely destroying shit like i can just see this backfiring in so many ways and just leaving them with outstanding like liabilities to the town and it just like so here, here's what i hope happened i hope they i hope they ico all of these these municipal bonds and then because the whole point of these things is to be fungible they don't know who owns the municipal bonds right so they don't really know who owns the town and then trump just buys up all the municipal bonds and just builds a huge casino right in the middle of berkeley <laughs> <laughs> welcome to trump town baby well, actually, what I think is more likely to happen, uh, someone in the troll box uh, mentioned that um, they're probably going to base the coin around proof of offense, uh, which I thought was funny. <laughs> so <laughs> what I think is going to happen is uh, you're going to get a bunch of people who have been, you know, who they consider to be offensive and they're going to buy all of the tokens. Proof of pronoun. The the supply is tied to the the current you know number of unique pronouns that we have to. Memorize. Oh, I, th I think that I think I think the supply of those is quite inflationary. I wouldn't I wouldn't want to use that. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, also, James Bond uh, would like to remind me that we're in warp speed. So my idea of traditional is obviously uh, traditional in terms of <laughs> in terms of me conceiving of time in these. Uh, very, very long periods because if everything is moving so fast, then the sense of what is traditional is like actually a span of months or years, a few years. But no, I'm going to I'm going to hold fast to the idea that using the word traditional for this kind of thing, especially ICOs, is not not realistic. <laughs> That's just because you're an old lady. You're actually like 113 right now in uh, Bitcoin time. So James, warp speed is not real. It's made up nonsense. 
from some old 60s show. I'm sorry, James. I'm sorry. I had to tell you that. Yeah, everyone thinks I'm older than I actually am, so I don't mind. <laughs> but, like, ah, this, like, this, like, this is too fast. Like, like again, this is, things are going too fast. Like, what the hell is, is Berkeley's serious long-term plan here? Like, how are they going to pay off these liabilities in time if they're doing this to depend less on federal funding? They're dependent on federal funding. Like, there's a problem there. Like, what can actually domestically be generated in terms of value to put them in a situation where they can pay this off like through tax revenue? Like, how is this actually going to work? Or do they think they can just hold their, their magic internet hat out and just get free money from the internet instead of the federal government? That's a lot of traditional thinking there. You're 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 giving way too much thought to long term uh, problems to be a good politician in Berkeley. Yeah, I actually have another idea because someone in the troll box just mentioned um, uh, safe. I think they're going to adopt made safe by accident because they're going to look like oh safe <laughs> <laughs> safe space. <laughs> we need a safe space. Let's use made safe. Seriously, that would be so cute if they did that. I hope they do that. That would be really funny because Made Safe hasn't really been going anywhere in the past several years. Like there was a lot of marketing around it, I think 2015, but it really, I haven't seen it do very much lately. So it'd be really funny if like Berkeley reinvigorated it and adopted it for Safe Space. I don't think they have any coherent plan. They've been around since like 2004 and just slapped blockchain on things um, when Bitcoin came around. Like <laughs> that, that, that would be, I don't know. I just killed the joke. Never mind. All right. Warp speed. You want warp speed? I told you that's a fictional thing, James. All right. This is, though, our last story. I believe the correct term is warf speed. <laughs> That's some pretty good Star Trek nerdery there. Good job. All right. Um, Coincheck is confirming that it's going to start yen withdrawals next week. That was two days ago. So pretty much by February 13th, withdrawals will be back up which is also the date that a report is due to the financial services uh, agency in Japan on their security and management improvements since the NEM hack. So I guess, uh, yeah, I guess the biggest hack in crypto space seems to be going well. I imagine something would have been said if they're unable to actually refund and process withdrawals for people affected by the hack. And, um, I guess at least until the report comes out, uh, it doesn't look like they're being shut down. So, yeah. How does it feel to have just survived the biggest uh, hack in crypto history and the, the whole process with the business just seemed boring? I don't know. I'm not really interested in crypto, so I don't really care. <laughs> If it had been but a Bitcoin I mean, hack, I, I would I would be a little more relieved that people are getting their money back. But since this is just NEM, like this is so stupid just to begin with. But yeah, I guess I'm glad people aren't getting ripped off even more. Well, I just think it's like, like think about it. Like that's what was the last like really big hack? The the Finex hack that kind of put shit in a wonky position for a bit kind of put shit in a wonky position here and it's the rebounds faster like the, the systemic effects on things are less like this the the exchange infrastructure is kind of making steps towards developing uh, enough redundancy to have a, a, an immunity to it Yeah, no, you're right. I mean, the more the more exchanges we have and the more the market cap is overall, the less one individual exchange will cause, you know, a, a lot of damage. So, yeah, that's good. We Alrighty then. I guess uh who's got some thoughts? 
last thoughts for the day. Oh boy. I'm going to have to look just a second. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you time. My, my final thought for the day is simplicity. Um, the, the new, uh, language that, um, oh man, I'm forgetting his name, but Russell O'Connor. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It looks really, really incredible. I've watched this presentation a couple of times, um, and, uh, looked through some of the stuff online and, uh, it looks like the way that you would want to do smart contract programming languages. Right. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Um, it's not just bringing over the garbage from Ethereum and throwing it on top of Bitcoin with RSK. It's actually a, uh, really well thought out, um, way to do smart contracts and, uh, it's not just smart contracts, but just, just to do programming on top of the blockchain, right? Whatever that means, uh, with, depending on what you mean by smart contracts, just anything that you want to write, um, that makes sense to write on top of Bitcoin. It looks like this is going to support, you're going to be able to write it in C, which is pretty great. Um, and, uh, you know, pretty great for this application anyway. And, uh, yeah, I think it's going to be amazing. So that's, that's my thought of the day. Uh, I'm excited that that stuff's happening and moving forward so fast. Mm -hmm. I guess Janine. Yeah, I have several thoughts. So there's been um, a story going around the last day or so um, about this uh, coder from India who made a price tracking app for crypto. I don't know if it's only big. I think it's multiple cryptocurrencies. But um, she actually released it at the end of January, but for some reason, Reddit picked it up uh, in the last two weeks or so, and they've been like being really nasty to her. Now, the interesting part of this is it's being portrayed as, oh, those those mean cryptocurrency dudes on Reddit. And like Reddit is a horrible place. I've never gone there. I think it's a waste of time. But um, actually, the reason that she got harassed so much is because a woman who I don't know the name of, I haven't I haven't looked into it, but I saw her. I saw like screenshots of her blog post that she wrote where she was calling out this girl as being a scammer and it ended up, ended up being debunked. And now that blog post is gone. Um, so it was actually a woman who started the harassment, which you don't hear happening that often. You just hear about how, you know, the dudes who are attacking her are using horrible language. And it's actually a woman's fault this time. Not surprising to me, but maybe surprising to people. Um, but yeah, she made this cool app that uh, makes it easy to track prices and, or she she made the the I think she made the user inter interface and then the back end was um, made by some contractors that she paid. Uh, still really cool. Um, check it out. Uh, and the next one is just a funny T-shirt that um, <laughs> that Bill Bill got in the mail uh, recently. I thought it was funny. Krugman fax machine. Yep. Everybody knows that the internet is only going to have the effect of a fax machine on the economy, Gene. Yeah. <laughs> That's a beautiful shirt. <laughs> yeah. I wonder where he got it from. I don't know if he made it himself or bought it. Yeah, I need, I need to fucking look for that because I've seen pictures of those floating around. I need oh, that. Okay. I need that the oversight shirt that uh, Rodolfo tweeted out. Yeah. And then the last one is, uh, well, actually it's two stories in one, but um, I don't actually th did, I think our last show was Thursday. Um, I, th I don't know. I can't remember if that was the day, but um, I think it would be good to mention that um, John Perry Barlow died recently. Um, there's been a lot of, um, you know, outpouring of support for him. A few people have regrettably decided to air their very minor grievances, as far as I understand, or at least as they describe it, minor grievances, and have, uh, I don't know what their intentions are, but anyway, he's been receiving a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, good messages about his impact on the internet, and especially his uh, declaration of, um the Declaration of um, Independence for Cyberspace. I can't remember the exact title. Um, Declaration of the... Does anyone remember? <laughs> I feel really bad now. That. It's like the... Dec it's that. I, 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 I don't know. I'm horrible with, with names of things. 
Yeah, it's something. Declaration of the Independence of Cyberspace, I think that's the title. Um, I also liked, he has this like list of principles that um, adult humans should live by. That was quite good. Um, not a lot of people uh, I've noticed uh, <laughs> around him and his space have been following that list, but whatever, they should pay more attention to them. Yeah, and uh, relatedly, uh, he was a, a supporter of Julian Assange and the fact that he's, uh, Julian Assange is still um, basically being held up in the Ecuadorian embassy for, he went in in 2012, I believe. So it's going on six years, I think. It would, in August, it will be six years. Um, interestingly, the UK might actually announce uh, whether he will be allowed to leave, or at least like he, he'll be able to leave without being impeded by the UK government. Um, two days from now, uh, February 13th, apparently they're going to announce it or make some kind of decision. So that should be interesting because um, uh, I think the biggest reasons are that the UK government was uh, not exactly handling the case well because they, um, they and also the Swedish government as well, uh, lost or deleted crucial um, emails that should have been included as evidence. And so they didn't handle that properly. And also if, the, the whole reason that the UK government is going after him is supposedly because he violated um, the terms of his bond, uh, bail bond, uh, which if he had been arrested at the time that he had violated that, that would have been, I think, a six month time in prison. So he served more than that time. And the Ecuadorian embassy is obviously not prison, but, you know, it's a really small building. Basically, he's living in one room. So not exactly not exactly uh freedom just uh just slightly less or slightly more comfortable than if he had been sent to prison and he served six years so i think that's more than enough time for a human being to be trapped in such a limited space so i think they're going to probably be uh they're probably not going to be too harsh in terms of what their decision is or at least i hope that's the case um so it might be possible that julian assange will be leaving ecuador this month they're leaving the Ecuadorian embassy. That would be amazing. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't bet on it, but um, I'm pessimistic. But that would be great. He definitely doesn't deserve to be in jail for being a decent journalist. Literally, exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, Acnix, got any last thoughts for today? Yeah, it's incredible. Six years coming. Like it, it'd be great to see him get out. But I mean, uh, I kind of. You know, I'll believe it when I see it, you know? Yeah, I guess uh, my last thoughts are Bitcoin. Slow the hell down. You're moving too fast, man. I guess uh, if you guys like listening to us, you can like and subscribe. If not, don't, I guess. We'll see you guys next time. Good loop. See you guys.